Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work in Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in IBM Europe. In this video, we're looking at the VO Server Shared Storage Pool Phase 6 and the new features that arrived in November 2016. Only carrying the new stuff here, I'm going to assume that you understand shared storage pools already. If not, look at the YouTube page and we'll have some starter pack video links there for you. This video is only about the new features in SSP Phase 6. We're assuming that you understand shared storage pools already. If you haven't, then we'll put some starter pack videos in the YouTube page. So how do you get to SSP 6? Well, you upgrade to VO Server 225 plus its six packs or above. When you've upgraded all of them to that level, then you'll get the new features. Just a little reminder, the cluster minus status minus verbose, look for the upgrade status lines when they're all on level then you know you've upgraded them or you can use my in cluster command that you'll find on my expert blog. I'm now going to go through these nine new features a couple of slides on each. So the big announcement is the shared storage pool can now go up to 24 VIO servers. In normal practice people use dual VIO servers so we're talking about 12 servers. Little reminder there that if you're doing live partition mobility it has to be within the shared storage pool so that the disks are available on the source and the target. Now if you need more than 12 servers, well you just have more than one shared storage pool. This actually limits the failure domain if you do lose a shared storage pool, very unlikely, but let's say it does happen, then you're only going to lose a subset of your machine room. Now the 24 is largely a testing and support statement. You can't phone up and ask for support if you've got more than 24. It can probably do it, but you can't ask. Um, it's a large effort for the shared storage pool development team. They, of course, when they're doing the testing of a new release, now 24 nodes, is an extreme high disk I.O. rates that they're going to generate in their testing to make sure that that works fine. Now, this foil says Nigel's notes. So this is my opinion. This is not an IBM statement. Uh, in my systems, I have very low I.O. rates. I don't have big production workloads or big databases or anything like that. And I can actually get higher than 24. Of course, I will not be supported if I had 34 in my shared storage pool and I found for support they'll ask me to take 10 of them out before they actually engage and support me. If I've got medium IO rates again I don't see any particular problems in here you may need to up the amount of CPU and memory in your VIO server and the way to determine that is to run the part command that actually runs n1 and then generates a nice report and it will clearly tell you that if it thinks it needs more CPU or more memory to maintain your workload. Do it this part come on in a busy period. Now if it's high or extremely high IR rates then we do need to take some care. In the installation readme um, or even in my own notes on my expert blog there's a discussion about this. What the shared storage pool testing has revealed is that if you're having very high I.O. rates and you're doing thin provisioning, for example, then they strongly recommend that the system data, which is the metadata tier, that's if you're thinking of a file system, it's the inode sort of data that's managing the blocks and the free lists. That that data goes on to some nice fast disks, uh, SSDs or flash disks so that they doesn't become a bottleneck. And again, we can monitor those I.O. rates. There's actually, in item 5, there's a new way we should be able to do that from the HMC, get an overall view of the I.O. rates in the whole of the shared storage pool. So that could be useful. Feature number 2 is officially supported disaster recovery. Quick reminder of what we had in the past couple of years. From developer works, we can download a script. Then at your own risk, you can use this to rebuild your shared storage pool on alternative hardware. You have to do a remote copy of your shared storage pooled LUNs to the other site, typically using your SanDisk to do this. We also need a backup of the shared storage pool configuration data, that's a simple command. If you have your failure, then you'll run this script to change the backup file because you now have a different set of VIO servers, you have a different set of LUNs making your shared storage pool, and you can actually do the mapping of the logical units to a new set of virtual machines. Once that backup file has been updated, then you can use that to restore onto a VIO server on your backup site and you can get your shared storage pool running just as it did on your original right. site. Now what they've done, they've made this um, officially adopted now, so it's not at your own risk, this is fully supported. Uh, the backup 
mechanism. There's some uh, extra features of the VIOS BR command to do automated regular backups. And then you will also, instead of running this script that you download, it's part of the VIO server BR command. Now this is a listing of the, all the VIO server BR command uh, details. I'm not going to go through all this, but you can see there's some sort of backups. There's viewing the backups and restoring the backups, but the red ones down here are new. So let's focus in on the new things. The VOS BR minus DR command that replaces the script and it's built into the VO server. Not going to go through the options in here, we'll probably make a different movie. Down below, we'll need that shared storage pool config information so we can automate the backups. And we do need to get those backups off the machine in case it fails. So here's the first of the RAS, the reliability, availability, and serviceability uh, new features. This is a cluster wide snap. Whenever you phone up AIX VO server support, guys, the first thing they'll ask is can we have a snap? With a shared storage pool, of course, we're operating a cluster, and so we might be dealing with an issue that is reported by one VO server, but is actually caused by another one, so we want a snap on all of the virtualized servers at the same time. Now, of course, that may be 16, maybe now 24 snaps have to be pulled together. Difficult to do that all at the same time. It can be very time-consuming bringing all these large files to one place to send it up to support. This actually does the snap for all the shared storage pool. It brings it into one big file, which is nice for uploading it. It's compressed and it's on the node that actually ran the command that started it all off. They're all time coordinated. There's an incrementing number called a coordinate number so that all the snaps are actually related to each other. And then that's set up to support for the diagnostics. Now you're never going to guess the name of the command. C snap would have been too obvious, wasn't it? But no, we've got CLFFDC for first failure data capture. Um, and we have some options in here. We've got priority. That says how fast it will actually engage in getting the data. I wouldn't use priority one on your production machines. We can also specify with the minus C option which parts of the system we actually want the data from. Um, I think we full is going to be the default most of the time. The data actually ends up in home, iOS, logs, SSP underscore FFDC as a directory. Horrible, but there we are. And the file name will be a CSNAP with a date and time in it. The component, that will be the, uh, the full priority, like a one or two. And the correlator is done by the incremented every time we run a CSNAP. Here's an example of the actual command. Let me go over here. Um, I've got 18 nodes in my cluster. And we ran the command. It took about 25 minutes. We run it as a, a root. Um, and when it finished, it came out to a whopping great 400 megabyte file. So I'm glad we didn't have to sort of manually move 18 files around and pull them all together in one file to do the upload. All right, the next RAS one is asymmetric network handling. This is an internal algorithm. Um, normally we have what's called a managing node. Uh, this is the one that organizes the cluster and decides who's in and out of it. Now, there's a rare condition in that the uh, cluster manager has partial network issues. You can imagine if you're sitting on one VO server and it can talk to VO servers A, B, and C, but X, Y, and Z it can't talk to. So that's sort of asymmetric, it's not all the same. Now, the, instead of the manager saying, OK, X, Y, and Z, I can't talk to them. They're obviously dead or they've crashed uh, or they've got some networking problem between the, me and them and throwing them out of the cluster and then having to do with anything they've got locked. The, what happens now is that the manager now says, OK, well, A, B, and Z, I can talk to you, but can you talk to X, Y, and Z? And if they can, then we on our VO server knows that we've got the problem rather than the X, Y, and Z. And so it can then make sure that it perhaps expels itself after passing on the, the management role to one of the other surviving nodes. And this results in when we've got flaky network issues, we get fewer unexpected expels are then being immediately joining back into the shared storage pool as it works out which ones have actually got the real problems. Um, this means that uh, while you fix up your network, your shared storage pool stays more up. Uh, but there's no actual features in here for you to 
change or any commands it's just uh, knowing that the networking is a, a lot more robust. The next browser feature then is this lease by clock tick. Typically when an SSP is running the VO servers are heart beating each other to spot an unresponsive node. The problem with that is that its data may be getting out of date and it will eventually expel it from the shared storage pool as unsafe. Then when it returns to the cluster it needs to catch up what it's missed so that its information is now current. In the past, if the user changes the time tate or time zone, it looks like a massive jump and it will say, whoa, there seems to be you know, 28 hours here that I was asleep. And it will decide its data is out of date and force itself to be expelled and then it will rejoin to refresh the data about the shared storage pool. And of course, this is not very good for any client virtual machines that it's doing I.O. for. So in the past, we had to use the CL start stop command to take ourselves out of the cluster, change the time and date, and then put ourselves back in. Because a lot of people forgot or didn't know that they had to do this operation. But as soon as we upgrade to um, phase 6 and its service packs, then we can change the date and time at any time, and it doesn't matter. The final one is increased event logging and picking apart some of those logs. If a problem is detected by the shared storage pool itself, it will automatically trigger a cluster snap. The pool admin command can be used to generate reports from that CSNAP data. It keeps a history of uh, user commands, particularly those that have failed, because that needs further investigation. Also, when a VR server is expelled from the cluster, it reports on the reasons why that happened, so that it helps um, after the event actually trying to work out what the real problem was. And there's also um, auto log analysis for common problems so it'll go looking detecting for the symptoms of a, of a known problem and it can then report back what it thinks is the problem you have the next feature is actually delivered with the HMC there's a new version the 860 it's just come out when you upgrade to that then you'll find the enhanced plus graphical user interface has some improved panels for the shared storage pool management and the HMC itself has faster screen updates so that's quite nice as well so here's my HMC running in enhanced plus graphical user interface mode these are my uh, VIO servers we click on the button up in here and look at shared storage pool clusters it shows me I've got one at the moment I do actually have a couple of crash and burn ones I use for new versions that uh, are not running at the moment so I'll can already see I've got three tiers and uh, 18 nodes in here. If we click on there, we get the details of this particular cluster. You can see the three tiers in here, six, seven, these were for my Power 6 and Power 7 machines. Haven't actually used them very much. Everything else is going into the default tier in here. You can see I've got eight terabytes. Over here, well, it says the mirrors are, are nice, so that's good. The failure groups are working. Over here you can see we're using about 30% of the tier, we're using a lot of thin provisioning. Then here's the alert number, if we use 90% then it will start putting uh, warnings and error messages into the HMC logs that everybody should be monitoring and you can take some actions. Down below we can see the repository disk, here it is, this is the actual name on my V7000, that's the label for that LUN which is good, gives me positive feedback that I know what I'm talking about and which one's which. I have a couple of spares in case I have an emergency. Down below in here then we have the nodes that are connected to the shared storage pool, all 18 VIO servers. We scroll back up to the top. Here we can see where we can add another tier to a shared storage pool. And um, if we go into a particular tier and again we can see the sizes for the tier in here we have the details of the LUNs that make up this particular tier so this is actual V7000 called TAN and the mirror is on a V7000 called DUN so that gives me a clear indication of the two again these are the, the actual names that we used on the V7000s we go back up in here though, this is the failure group view of the LUNs. We can actually say, well, what are the LUs, the virtual disks uh, in here? We can get a complete list of all our virtual disks and sizes. Um, we have lots and lots of them. You can see the size, thin provisioning or not. And if we click on uh, one, 
we can then get to actions for that, increase the size, remove it, or move it to a different tier. Normal to have different tiers are actually different sets of disks at the back end, so I can move it from one V7000 to another V7000 that I have as a different tier. Now that's the view of the shared storage pool. How does uh, a virtual machine see that? I'll click on this one here. It's been pinned to my favourite website, Blue. And we can fiddle about with our virtual machine in here. Here we actually have our virtual storage, so I'll click on that. So it's telling me I've got very little in virtual SCSI sort of way of connecting things up. Although the virtual storage pool comes in as a vSCSI, it's not a vSCSI disk from the virtual I.O. server, for example. In, it knows about the shared storage volumes being attached in here. Here they are. It's my root VG. We've got a scratch area back up, and this is where all my website data is actually held. If I click on one of these, and we can see what we can actually do in here. Uh, modify the connections, remove it, increase the size of it, particularly nice if you're running out of space in a volume group, I can just put more data in it. And again we could migrate this particular LU to another disk. Very nice way of graphically changing things on the fly. We go back to the top here and click on here. We can allocate more space from the shared storage pool. So we can define a new device in here and give it a space or we can find an existing logical unit virtual disk and pull that in. That can actually be a nice way of moving data between virtual machines. Uh, bring it in, push the data into a JFS file system and then move it to a different virtual machine and uh, remount those disks and uh, pull out the data again. The next one comes with the HMC2, upgrade to the latest 860 release. It has a new feature generally called Performance and Capacity Metrics, PCM for short. Uh, this includes the shared storage pool stats, which is useful for uh, us. Uh, this is extracted via the REST API in JSON format, and I'm not a big fan of JSON format. Here's a little example of the SSP data. Very, very helpful. Ten times bigger than it really needs to be because it duplicates all the labels for every single number. has a great big label attached to it. But if we look at some of the details, we have both a tier or pool or tier data level overall looking across the, the whole shared storage pool. whole bunch of stats available. Some of it looks uh, very interesting. Looking at the free size, we can see that going up and down and that sort of thing as well as the I.O. rates. There's also information for individual disks. Now, if you've got, you know, 32, 64, 128 LUNs in your shared storage pool, then that probably be too much data that you actually want. Although it would be nice to see that the various disks, assuming they're all reasonably the same sort of size, you should expect the same I.O. going to each of those. I hope to generate a worked example and have that in a different video. And the last feature is a little one, but uh, quite a good one. We LU list command, uh, list your logical units, your virtual LUNs or virtual disks. Uh, we have a new feature called uh, ATRA for attribute provisioned equals true or false. So this lists the LUs that are either mapped or unmapped into a virtual machine. The actual name is a little bit clumsy in my humble opinion. Um, it's not thin provisioned or uh, thick provisioned. Uh, provisioned is false or true. In the case down in here, it's um, provisioned, so it is connected to a virtual machine, but it's not actually telling you which virtual machine that is. Um, but you can use my nmap command, you'll find that in my Air Expert blog. And we're done, so here are the highlights. Don't forget to look at the YouTube page for any subsequent videos.